Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about deception. As security professionals, it's our job to stop attackers from gaining access to our systems and our resources. Now, as good as we are, we may not always be able to stop the attackers from gaining access. But one thing we can do to give ourselves a bit more time if an attacker does get in is to use the power of deception and disruption. This could include feeding the attackers misinformation about the network and the systems, or sending fake responses to their requests, which will mislead and confuse them. And while all of this is happening, unknown to the attackers, they're setting off alarm bells for the defenders to respond to. One of the oldest and probably the most common type of deception technique is something called a honeypot. Now, a honeypot is designed to attract the attackers. It acts as a kind of lure enticing the attackers into a controlled environment. Now, the attackers think they're making progress in their attack. However, in reality, they're just setting off alarm bells for the security teams and being investigated. Honeypots are not only great at giving security teams more time to respond, but they can also serve as an excellent intelligence gathering tool observing and analyzing the attacker's behaviors. A honeypot could be a single computer which has purposely been misconfigured. The attacker then may find this computer, see that as an easy target, and then launch their attack. Unknown to the attackers though, they have just logged into a controlled environment. Everything is fake and the security teams have been alerted. Some companies may decide to take this a step further and add more machines and even networking devices to keep the attacker's attention for longer. This is called a honey net. Okay, so honeypots usually fall into one of two categories. We have low interaction honeypots and we have high interaction honeypots. This describes the level of interaction that the attackers can have with that honeypot. Low interaction honeypots are usually based on a specific service or a specific application. They're easy to set up and require little resource. However, they provide very little interaction for the attackers, making them less realistic and easier for the attackers to spot. High interaction honeypots are fully functional systems that give the attackers much more interaction. These are great for keeping the attackers occupied for longer and collecting more information. However, they are more complex and because they are actual vulnerable machines, they introduce more risk into the network. Okay, so now let me show you a honeypot in action. I have this attacker machine and this machine is on the corporate network. So the next step for the attacker is to try and figure out whether there are any devices on the network and if there are any services that we may be able to use to launch our attack. To do this, we're gonna run a simple Nmap scan. If you're not familiar with Nmap, it's a tool that scans networks for devices and for open ports. So let's do that now. I will type Nmap-SV192.168.216.0 slash 24. This tells Nmap to scan the network 192.168.216.something and look for any open ports. And I'll press enter and it will start to run. And after a minute, you can see we have a hit. We can see that host 192.168.216.134 is up. It's also running a service on port 2222 and it's running SSH. Now that's not the normal port number for SSH, but Nmap was able to identify the service. We can also see that Nmap believes this to be a Linux machine. So as the attacker, we now have a target. The next step may be to try and log into this machine and hope that the password is an easy one for us to guess. So let's do that. If we type SSH-P for port number, and remember it's port 2222. We'll log in with the user root and we'll type at 192.168.216.134 and press enter. We'll accept this. And now it asks us for a password. So let's just take a wild guess and do something like password 123 and we press enter. And guess what? It looks like we had a lucky guess and we've now successfully logged in to this machine. So now let's run some commands. So we could type, who am I? Just to see who we're logged in as. So yep, we're logged in as root, which is like the Linux admin. We can run pwd, which will tell us which directory we're in. So we're in the slash root directory. Now let's move to the top directory by typing cd. So change directory space slash. And let's list all of the contents for this directory. So we type ls. And as you can see, we have files and folders in this machine. We can even try and find some user information by looking at a system file. So I'm going to type cat 
dash etc dash password and press enter. That really looks like I lost my connection. So we'll just connect back in and cat etc dot password and press enter. Now we're seeing some user information that would be really useful in an attack. And this all seems great from the attacker's perspective, but not all is as it seems. This isn't a real machine that we're connected to right now. This is, in fact, our honeypot pretending to be an insecure machine, and it's all fake. In fact, that password that was the lucky guess, it didn't really matter what I typed there, it would have let me in anyway. And while our attacker is busy looking at system files and directories, our honeypot is logging everything and alerting the security teams. So if I switch back to the honeypot machine, I'll log in. We can see all of the commands I entered. So up here, we see who am I? We see PWD. We saw that we changed directory, that we ran LS to list the contents. And then we got kicked out, but we logged back in. Again, we changed the directory and we listed the contents of the password file. It also shows the IP address of the machine that was connecting, which is this .133, which is the IP address of the attacker's machine. So by using a honeypot like this, as soon as a connection is made and commands start being entered, the security teams will be alerted to that potential attacker inside the network. Now, this particular honeypot is described as a medium interaction honeypot. So somewhere in between the low and the high interaction. This is because it allows for some interaction by the attacker. However, it's not a real system as used in those high interaction honeypots. It just pretends to be. So it falls somewhere in the middle. As well as honeypots, we have something called honey files. A honey file is a very tempting looking file that's designed to get an attacker to interact with it. Now the file might be designed to look like a crucial configuration or a system file or it could even look like it contains some sort of sensitive or confidential information that an attacker would love to get their hands on. For example, we could have a file called passwords.doc. Now, if the attacker takes the bait and attempts to access the honey file, a detection is raised informing the security team of an attacker within the network. Let me show you a really simple honey file example. Here is my computer. Now let's open a browser and browse to canarytokens.org. Using canary tokens, we can create our own honey file in just a couple of clicks. You can see all of the different options that we have here. Not all of these are for honey files though. Some of them are for honey tokens, which we'll come to in just a moment. I'm gonna select the Microsoft Word one. All we have to do is enter an email address to send our alert to, and just add a little reminder, just in case we add multiple of these. And then when we press create canary token, it will give us a link to download our file. So now that's downloaded, we go to the downloads directory. There is our file. So as you can see, this has a pretty terrible name. So we're gonna rename this something that would look tempting to attackers. So I'm gonna right click, rename, and we're gonna call this passwords. Then we just need to place this somewhere we think the attacker may look. So I'm just gonna pop this onto desktop. And here is our file. Now, if an attacker was able to get access to this computer, they may see this file called passwords and decide to check it out. But what they don't know is once opened, this file will connect back to Canary Tokens, who would then alert us that the file was just opened. So let's give that a go. I'm gonna double click on the file. So ignore the trial message. I'm just gonna click, I have a product key and then exit out. And we can see this file is in fact blank. But if we check our email, we can see an alert has come through from Canary Tokens warning us that this file has been accessed. So that's a really simple Honey file example that you can try yourself at home. Next, let's look at Honey Tokens. A Honey Token is a piece of data that is placed as bait for any attackers that might come across it. They come in many different forms. Some of the most common honey tokens are fake email addresses. These email addresses should never be used. If any interaction is seen relating to them, well, then it's a clear indication that some sort of intrusion has occurred. We also have fake credentials. Just like the fake email addresses, fake credentials could be added to like a database or anywhere else an attacker may look for them. The credentials won't work, but if someone was to try and use them, 
well, it's going to trigger some alerts for the security teams. We also have API tokens. Now, APIs are great ways for an attacker to interact with an application. Again, by adding fake API tokens, an attacker can be spotted when they try to use them. And we have data. Honey tokens can do more than just detect breaches. They can also be used to trace back to the original source. For example, you could add a unique string of characters to your data or even fake records to your data. That could then be traced back to the original source if data happens to disappear outside of the company. I have a great example for this. I actually spoke to someone who was working at a popular online store and they told me that they used to add unique tokens to order confirmations. Now, this is because there was a global shortage of a popular product at the time. People were then buying them and selling them at ridiculous prices. The resellers would then post their order confirmations online, not realizing they contained a unique token. The IT staff could then use this token to track back that original order and cancel it. So these tokens can be used in many different ways and they appear in many different forms. Essentially though, they are just pieces of data that can be used to monitor use. Just like we did with the Honey files, you can use Canary tokens to create some of your own Honey tokens. For example, they have an email address option which will give you a dummy email address. You can then place this into a database of some sort and if anyone steals the database and tries to send an email to the address, you will be alerted. Now let's talk about Honey accounts. User accounts are prime targets for attackers. They can be used to escalate permissions, move around undetected, and they can even be used to trick others to believing the attacker is actually someone from within the company. A Honey account is a non-legitimate account which should never be used. This account is then given weak credentials, making it an easy target for the attackers. Now, attackers may use various password attacks on the user accounts in an effort to gain access, such as brute force attacks or password spraying. Now we're gonna cover both of these later in the course. Because the Honey user is weak by design, in theory, it should be one of the first accounts to be cracked. Then once the attacker authenticates with that user, the security teams will be notified. This video is part of our Security Plus in 31 Days course. If you like this video, you are gonna love the full course. Not only does it cover each exam topic in simple and easy to understand videos, but it also provides hands-on labs. These labs guide you through practical tasks like creating Trojans, cracking passwords, and sending your own phishing emails, giving you real-world experience and making your studies that much more engaging and effective. It doesn't stop there though. You also get a copy of our Security Plus in 31 Days ebook which follows the course and covers each topic. You'll also get access to helpful downloads to support your learning, a private community where you can connect with fellow learners and exclusive discounts. It really is the complete package to guide you through your Security Plus journey. Check it out in the description below. Okay, so that's Honey Pots, Honey Files, Honey Tokens and Honey Accounts. Really useful deception and disruption methods we can use to help detect and combat attackers within our systems. But keep in mind, they're not always guaranteed to work. Attackers know about these methods and they will try to avoid systems and accounts if they suspect them to be fake. As the old saying goes, if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. To end this video, let's go through a couple of quiz questions. Question one, you are a security administrator for a large corporation and you've noticed an increase in attempts to access your network from external IP addresses. You decide to deploy a honeypot to gather intelligence about these attackers. What type of honeypot should you deploy if you want to gather extensive information about the attacker's techniques and you're willing to accept a higher level of risk to your environment? Is it A, a low interaction honeypot, B, a high interaction honeypot, C, a honey file, or D, a honey token? The correct answer is of course B, 
a high interaction honeypot. This is because you want to gather information about the attacker's techniques, which only come from the high interaction honeypots. Okay, so now let's look at an exam question from our friends over at Bosin using their Exim Max practice exams. Your company CEO suspects that the company network is being regularly attacked by malicious users. The CSO asks you to implement a network of tools that you can use to gather information about the method of attack. Which one of the following are you most likely to implement? Is it A, a honeypot? Is it B, a botnet? Is it C, a DNS sinkhole? Or is it D, a honey net? And if I go down to the show answers button, we can see the correct answer is D, a honey net. And I'll scroll down so you can see the explanation. Feel free to pause and take a read. Again, that question was from the Bosin Exim Max, which I highly recommend. You can find the link below in the description. Oh, and remember, Serpro's premium students with the full course also get a nice discount as well. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, leave a comment and subscribe. The support from you guys really helps this channel grow. Other than that, thank you for watching.